let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm your host. I'm the forum's creator, and I'm your chief cat herder for the next hour of conversation. We've been looking at the history of higher education from time to time in the forum. We haven't really plunged deeply into it, which is why I'm delighted, delighted to introduce you to Emma Levine. Her most recent book, Allies and Rivals, uh, is a tremendous, exciting look at reframing what we know about the research university. Without, without trying to do it too much injustice, it's a look at the parallel evolution of the research university in the United States and in Germany over the past 200 years. It constructs a fantastic way of rethinking almost everything we know, uh, from academic freedom to the relationship between government and academia, to the role of individual faculty members, to how these institutions evolve, change, and innovate over time. I can't recommend this book highly enough. And as part of that recommendation, I'm now going to bring to the stage Professor Emily Levine from Stanford University. Welcome. Hi. Welcome to the Future Hi, Trend. Hi, Brian. It's, it's so great good to, to be you. here. I'll call you Professor Levine once, yeah. and then I promise not to do it again. <laughs> okay, that sounds perfect. It's so good of you to join us. Thank you, especially during the end of semester, where things are no doubt uh, very chaotic. and, and <laughs> Indeed, and you'll have to excuse my voice as I have the end of semester grip as well. Oh, no. Oh, I, hope, <laughs> I hope it's just the grip. And yes, yeah, indeed. <laughs> Well, Emily, um, please let us, you know, we have a tradition on the forum. When we ask people to introduce themselves, we, we don't ask for a CV. Because this is the future transform, we ask about your future. And specifically, what are you going to be working on for the next year? What are the big topics or the big projects, or in your case as well, the research and the classes that are uppermost in mind for you? Right. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, again, thank you for that generous introduction. Um, and thank yeah. you for having me. Um, so to answer your question, I was I think I'll begin by saying something about my scholarly background and the goals of the book that you just held up, Allies and Rivals, on the origins of the modern research university. And what I see is the potential for this work for change makers in the university. Good. So I'm an intellectual historian by training, which may sound a bit esoteric, uh, but I suggest to you that there's two ways in which my work is oriented towards the future. So first, I excavate the origins of ideas that often go unquestioned. And I do this by putting them back in their place and time in which they were formed and received, making us more critical participants in the culture around us. And second, I account for how institutional change occurs. And if you wanna make change in the university, I would argue that you need history to understand the university's capacity to evolve. So um, if it's okay with you, Brian, I was thinking I could give you a sense of how I do this with the institution and the, I, um, um, and the idea of the modern research university in which many of us make our home and what consequences this story of origins and emergence might have for the future. I can do that in about eight minutes or so, if that would well, if, if, you, if you want yeah. to start on that, yeah, yeah, then, I could I could get started. And then I and then I'd like to and then I'd like to uh, see what people questions people have for you because they may already be wedding to pounce. Okay, perfect. So so um, the questions that I was sort of asking myself when I thought about the future um, is why are teacher teaching and research together under one roof? Hmm. How did this come about, and why is it so hard to change? Slash should we change it? Um, so, so the history of the modern university that I lay out in the book dates to the University of Berlin, which was established in 1810. And it was founded in the wake of war to recreate, as was said at the time, intellectually what had been lost politically. And those, create, those conditions created two needs, to train a new civil service and an army so that Prussia wouldn't lose any more wars and to operate as an independent institution of knowledge for an aspiring nation. The main innovation that was to accomplish these goals was to create an institution that would unite the advancement of knowledge through research with its dissemination through teaching. And this bundle became known as the Modern Research University 
And as I chart in the book, it was a wild success, inspiring an American adaptation that combined the German version focused on graduate education with the English undergraduate college already prevalent in the US to produce what sociologists sometimes call a hybrid uh, institution that would be emulated then the world over. And what's interesting that we might wanna discuss, I think is that from the moment it was founded in Germany and iterated upon in America, there were contradictory cries that, the, that this new university was both already firmly established um, that is here to stay and also inefficient and totally insufficient, <laughs> a paradox that uh, persists uh, to this day. And so what we see over time, if we look at the last hundred years um, as sort of a cycle of discontent in which new institutions are founded that aim to address that inefficiency by devoting itself exclusively to one task or the other, teaching or research. And that's the kind of pattern that I think, you know, as should sound pretty familiar, I think, to us today. Um, so if we look at, say, for example, um, the period right after World War I, uh -huh. the interest in the German model begins to wane and a window opens for academic innovators who want to devote more attention to teaching um, and one-on-one -on -one instruction that they feel has been overshadowed by the emphasis on specialization and research. And so in the 1920s, we see the liberal arts colleges have a sort of revival of sorts. Um, we see J John Dewey's stock go up and the, and the sort of Wilhelm von Humboldt's stock go down. And we get colleges like Bennington College, Sarah Lawrence College, Reed College, Black Mountain College, all dating to this, this period. No. Um, at the same time, we get education reformers coming from the other side, like someone like Abraham Flexner, who ridicules the way that the American University has has become sort of what he calls the department store of knowledge. And he says, we need new institutions of research because we're not doing this good enough. And he begins to found the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, which would open in 1933 and bring top scholars in their fields without the distractions of teaching to ensure the American preeminence in research. And in fact, he has in mind a kind of Max Planck Institute in America mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which itself had already been founded in 1910 to create more research uh, space that was outgrowing the university so that Germany could remain competitive internationally. But what's interesting is that despite these sort of additions to the system, the model of the, re the university that combines both of these tasks remains remained and has remained, I think, the gold standard. Oh. And 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 I, I think for our purposes, we might think about how the inefficiency of that system has huge implications, um, in particular for the undervalued and unsupported half of the sort of bundle um, teaching. We should, we should. And so, and uh, I see maybe that there's some questions that have appeared in the. We have we have in, several. In the interim. And and by the way, I have to get I have to get this joke in. You speak of my alma mater many times in the book, the University of Michigan, and and uh -huh. like I said, yes, yes, uh, that, <laughs> there is some inefficiency there. Uh, we had a quick question from uh, Greg Shuckman who asks, wasn't Johns Hopkins University considered the birth of modern research university? And I said, yeah, it's chapter two, buddy. Uh, but but <laughs> Emily, do you want to do you want to say a bit more about that? Sure, I can say exa uh, something about that. <laughs> exactly. So. So one cr crucial way in, in my telling that universities adapt is through taking sort of op th opposing threats, institutions that are opposing threats, and then integrating them into their institutions to form um, new institutions. And as I said, this is a process that sociologists sometimes call hybridization, and the institutions that results are hybrids. So Johns Hopkins is a perfect example of it. And in my telling, it is the first American iteration of the sort of ideal type in the Max Weberian language of the modern research university, the one that would have the most longevity, as you, as you say. And, and the story, I think, goes something like this. In the 1860s and 1870s, Daniel Coit Gilman, another incredible education founder that I'm hoping to bring out of obscurity as a model for an academic entrepreneur, yeah. He saw that American boys, and it was mostly boys, although some 
young women as well, were starting to go abroad to Germany to get graduate education, um, which wasn't available in the US. And he begins to advocate for creating German style um, graduate programs at home. And he starts to do this and tries to do this at Yale in the 1860s by kind of grafting a research university onto Yale. And he has some success. He raises the standard of admission. He introduces the PhD, but he's only able to take it so far. He then goes out to California, which gets a mention in the book, the University of California. And he tries to do this at a new land grant institution. Um, but he finds that he's just, um, and, and he's fighting too much with the Board of Regents and the agricultural lab lobby has is too much power. And so he kind of gives up there. And then he gets his sort of winning ticket, as Greg says, um, in the form of an unprecedented amount of money at the time. It's $7 million, right? <laughs> which was the most money by far that had been given for a university at the time, half of which would go to a new university in Baltimore. And it would be privately funded and there would be no strings attached. So Gilman could kind of create the vision that he wanted. And what he does, as, as you're right, Greg, is he combines the English style um, liberal arts college or English style college, which gives the BA at the time with the German style graduate school. And it's that rebundling of these two sides, research and teaching, that becomes the winning combination, as I said, the modern research university in its American form. And of course, that's the one that then would be emulated the world over. That's a fantastic answer, Emily. <laughs> that's, um, you just nailed that. And uh, Greg, thank you for, for the question. By the way, you should all be able to see on the kind of bottom leftish part of the screen, a, a mustard color box that says allies and rivals. Click that and that'll take you to the uh, university press behind that. Um, Greg does go on to say, we continue to import German models literally with the adoption of the Fraunhofer yeah. Institutes in the US. Well, it's an interest, it's, a po it's an important point because the, in, innovation doesn't stop. And I think that's sort of, it's an evolving story. So you know, the, the formation of the modern university in Germany and in, in Berlin in 1810 is not the end. And, and Johns Hopkins in 1876 is not the end. Um, it quickly, what, what I try to convey in the book is that there's, this is an ecosystem of what I call competitive emulation in which education reformers are going back and forth at, in this period between Germany and America that are the big players. And in particular between cities like Baltimore, Göttingen, Berlin, and yes, then Ann Arbor, and, 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 and soon Palo Alto. <laughs> and they are, are exchanging ideas about how to organize ideas and then coming up with new institutions that then um, um, will themselves then be emulated in different contexts. And so I think when we, one of the things I try to do in the book is in moving away from, say, biography of particular individuals. No, no. Um, like, like I know, have, is this is not a hagiography of Daniel Coit Gilman or of Abraham Flexner, and it's not an institutional history of Johns Hopkins anymore that it's an institutional history of University of Michigan. We do have many wonderful books like that out here already. What I try to do is by showing the whole system, um, illustrate that process by which ev that evolution happens in that competitive emulative relationship. And I think that that process tells us something not only about Johns Hopkins or about the rise of Germany and America as new world powers at the end of the 19th century, but it tells us something I think about how innovation happens. And that's the story I think we can take with us forward. And there's a lot of great stuff about the different ways this works. and and. Uh, Friends, uh, I just want to make sure that you know that on the bottom of the screen, you can press one of those two buttons to uh, give us a question. In fact, we have one question right now. <laughs> I'm going to be so bold as to beam on stage. Um, and this, this Emily, is in part because the person about to beam on stage is fluent in German. So um, no doubt, no doubt, the puns will fly thick and fast. So, um, hello, Tom. I will rapidly get into trouble trying to speak German at this point. I'm, I'm highly rusty. Um, but I did have an English language question for you. <laughs> yeah. um, how do we reconcile? One of the problems with the way the German system works and this clumping at the university of, of research and, 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 and <laughs> teaching and so on 
is that the German system has multiple layers and levels. And so um, it can lead to an elitist attitude toward education. And a very, I mean, the Germans have Akademisches Deutsch. I mean, it's a whole other language than most Germans can't understand, right? Hmm. And the United States has always, at least, or at least since the 1950s, has uh, given a nod to equality of opportunity, equality of education, mass education. In a, in a world driven by technology uh, and the kind of things that, you know, we expect just even regular workers to be able to do these days, you know, is that model relevant anymore? And uh, how do we, you know, avoid the dangers of this, you know, ivory tower, so to speak? Um, give you a good example. Another thing is that the system, the German system for a long time was sexist. My mother uh, was kept out of the gymnasium because she was a girl and they said she couldn't do it. And so she went to the Realschule and never got to go to college until she came to the United States. And then she graduated summa cum laude from a small liberal arts college here when she was 40. So, I mean, this is a problem with the German system is that it's, it's very elitist. Uh, and, and I think that that combination of research and teaching focuses on, it tends to push people in the direction of the research side of things. And oh, by the way, if you can keep up, come along. But if you can't, sorry, too bad, so sad. So I was wondering if you could speak to those dichotomies yeah. between the American and the German system. Please. Yeah, so those are, are two both really excellent questions, Tom. And um, I, I hear you talking about two different sets of issues. One mm -hmm. is the tension between meritocracy and democracy that I think mm -hmm. um, are still actively in, in kind of friction in our system. And then the second is, is the question of, of how, who gets to belong to these institutions and how perhaps that question has changed over time as the system has and the institutions have opened increasingly to more and more people. So let me take the second one first, um, particularly with the, with the example of co-education. Um, because I think one thing that I tell in this story is that when you look at that, the, the story of co-education in the transatlantic context, actually some surprises are revealed. So, so mm. first of all, as I mentioned, it wasn't just boys who were going to Germany in the 1870s. In the 1880s, and in particular in the 1890s, um, young women start to go as well. And one of the reasons they start to go is because they recognize that the PhD is now the holy grail in institutions of higher education. And to get the PhD would mean to have a certain kind of credential, as we would say today, that has the capital that would make this old white men who were the gatekeepers of the system take them seriously. And at the time um, in German universities, which of course were organized regionally, um, women were allowed to be gasterer or auditors in the university. And in some places they could also get degrees on a case by case basis. Um, and what they were able to do was they were able to get, if they could find a sort of open-minded professor, um, um, there were some of them in Leipzig and many of them in Zurich, they could get them to agree to take them on in cultural history or in mathematics. And they would kind of move around from institution to an institution until they, until they could get themselves the PhD and come home. And Martha Carey Thomas, who would go on to be the president of Swarthmore, was wow. one example of this um, in the 1880s. And what Thomas and other feminists at the time realized that they can do using the system of competitive emulation, they already get that this is how things evolve, is they realize that they can put pressure on American institutions by saying, look, German institutions are actually starting to open up. And so you're gonna lose us also, just like you lost the young men to German institutions in the last generation, unless we account for women as well. And so co-education becomes a kind of hybridization of the threat of losing the women and of trying to incorporate um, these new students into the institutions. And certain um, education reformers, like the founders of Swarthmore, um, see how this could be um, valuable. And they, they pursue this through single sex education. And Thomas actually says she wants Swarthmore Sorry, I'm saying Swarthmore, but I mean Bryn Mawr. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I meant Bryn Mawr. <laughs> Pardon me. So Bryn Mawr, of course, she wants Bryn Mawr, of course, in, um, in uh, Pennsylvania to be the 
um, Hopkins of uh, for women, the place where women can go pursue uh, PhDs. And so she elevates women's education through single sex education, and it becomes a kind of hybridization um, of the old model with the new that introduces women to the system. Um, and so there's a way in which I think you can see um, the history of institutions as sort of um, innovations coming actually from tapping undervalued talent like women. Um, and this would also happen with, with Jews at Hopkins and later it would happen with African-American education. Du Bois also creates institutional hybrids at the, moder at, at the margins of the ecosystem. Um, and, and I think that this cycle um, you know, isn't yet finished today. And there's still ways in which we um, can, can be better at identifying um, un untapped talent to make our institutions more accessible as well. Um, so that's one kind of way in which I think you can think about um, the story, in particular about co-education. The larger, I think, existential um, question is still with us today. Um, the German system, as you said, didn't have democratic aims. It was elite and intended for a small segment of the population. And what, what Gilman, as well as Elliot and other presidents, um, US, president, US university presidents at the time, were aiming to do, and Abraham Flexner as well, was to sort of wedge a German system intended for a select few into a country that had democratic values. And it's a kind of, um, it's not such a smooth transition, right? They create, they do a lot of gymnastics in order to sort of justify this. They, 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 they invent a term called the aristocracy of excellence and they, begin to talk about the need for raising standards to keep American institutions um, competitive. And you can say that they prioritize this over any real efforts to democratize the system um, outside that tapping undervalued talent as a source of innovation that I mentioned before. And so I think that where we see this tension continue today is precisely in that bundle of research and teaching where re research follows those values of meritocracy. You know, we, we lavish more funds on the best and the brightest in the hopes of advancing the frontiers of knowledge. And yet teaching has this sort of the value system of democratic uplift that, you know, we have this purpose to sort of uplift the whole society and education is expected to do a lot more work than it is in the German or European system at large. And, and I think that's a tension that um, is one we need to spend much more time talking about and figuring out how to address. And I think the origin story helps to show how that gets, um, how it gets solidified into our system and why it's so hard to reverse. That's yeah, great. Yeah, wonderful answer. Brian, Brian, I just have a quick question for you. And I don't know if you have the answer or, or, or maybe Emily knows, but uh, um, <laughs> are there more German students in the United States as international students or vice versa? I don't you know. Mean, oh, today? I don't know. An an yeah. Anecdotally, uh, I've always encountered more German students here than American students in Germany. But I, it's, that's I totally anecdotal. I don't have the data on it at all. I didn't know if you guys had, but my father has a PhD from a German university, and uh, and he's an American. So <laughs> there's a there's, there's a counter example for you. But. So that would fit into the <laughs> long tradition that this book describes. Yeah, uh, I, 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 <laughs> I kind of live that tradition. <laughs> Tom, thank Tom, you very Tom, much. Thank you very much. If if you're new to the forum, that's an example of video. <laughs> easy as can be to, to do. So please uh, click the raise hand button if you want to follow Tom. Uh, Emily, quick language question. Uh, you said aristocracy of excellence. In the early 21st century, when Germany launched the excellence initiative, was that supposed to echo that older term? Um, I mean, not that not that precisely, I don't think. But I, okay. but I do think that, that that what you see, and I think this, this sort of addresses in some ways the cultural shift that Tom was just referring to, which is that if if Germany is sort of this is the incumbent and America the sort of innovator in, in the in the first part of the hundred years that I um, I'm talking about from 1810 to say 
Uh -huh. Well, really from 1810 to 1900, maybe even pushing 1910, what we begin to see around 1900 is that, um, is that Germans start to come to America to learn from Americans as well, right? And so the innovation, for example, of co-education, which um, will come in the form of Stanford and University of Chicago as answers to the, the single sex education of Bryn Mawr that we were just talking about, Co-education is this, is a sort of innovation in America that Germans like Felix Klein, a mathematician who comes to America at the end of the 19th century, is looking at and saying, hey, we have this shortage of teachers in Germany and I have a shortage of graduate students and there's all these aspiring female mathematicians. Um, I'm going to convince, convince the Prussian ministry to let me take them on and I'm going to start advocating for co-education. So we see co-education then sort of, wow. sort of swim um, mm -hmm. upstream the other way. And you see a similar thing start to happen with, with ideas like private philanthropy, that is the, the private funding of, yes. of scholarship, which is very much present in the debates around 1900 and in the first decade of the 20th century, in mm -hmm. which the Germans are beginning to um, found institutions outside of their university a system like the Institute devoted to physical chemistry and then the Max Planck Institutes, which uh -huh. Uh -huh. of course would first be called the Kaiser Wilhelm Society or Kaiser Wilhelm Institutes. And in that story, you see, you, you're, you begin to see a two-way exchange. You know, um, um, it's, the story is typically told as Americans import the German model um, right. into America. But right. my point is actually that the, that 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 change happens through bi-directional exchange. Mm -hmm. And we see that already among Germans and Americans. And so, you know, rather than seeing this squarely as, you know, the, the sort of Germans are on top and then the Americans are on top, I think there's more subtlety in that story that perhaps yeah. we would need to tell the story that um, uh, Tom was was kind of alluding to. So yes, you have examples, um, as you were saying, um, Brian, something like the Excellence Initiative that began in 2013, I think, um, which was um, a, a nearly explicit um, initiative to emulate the Ivy League in Germany, that is create a more tiered system with a group of institutions that were considered elite that would get more funds as a result, and therefore the better students and better researchers, um, in some ways kind of splitting the system into a kind of meritocratic and a democratic uh, system more along the lines of what we were talking about. You see then the active use of that English language. Um, mm. And in fact, I have a picture at the end of the book of a banner that was hung um, in Berlin that um, says, um, uh, excellence in research and teaching across the University of Berlin. So now we no longer see sort of Forschung, uh, durch Wissenschaft or Bildung. We no mm -hmm. longer see the sort of German language that sort of was, in, was, was, was taken on by the Americans and often had no clear English translation. We now see the English words like excellence oh, used oh. in the German co context, which, which have an American connotation yeah. that is not just a word, but rather encompasses the whole system of merit meritocratic uh -huh. sort of justification for, you could say, inequitable distribution of resources, right? Um, now now um, adapted and influential in the German context. Well, that's fantastic. And uh, as, as, a, as a literature and language person, I'm astonished that you were able to create that beautiful arc from the word excellence. Um, that was uh, that was perfect. Thank you. Uh, we had a quick comment that came in uh, for Tom's question. <coughs> the uh, IIE, the uh, uh, Institute for International Education, should have the data that you were looking for, Tom. Um, that comes in from yeah. uh, Bill Lu Bill Lacey at UC Davis. That makes uh, sense. Speaking of Bill Lacey, he has another question. Let me just flash this on the screen. Uh, you focus on two key functions of higher education: research and teaching. What place do you see for a third key function, outreach and engagement or application of knowledge? Good question, Bill, thank you. Yeah, that's an awesome question, Bill, and I'm so glad you asked it because of course there are three tiers to the modern research university, research, teaching, and service. 
And the service piece is really a misnomer because I think it really encompasses the relationship between universities and their outside, everything outside its walls, for lack of a better word. Um, and one of the big themes in the book, and I've been exploring recently with colleagues at Stanford, is what I would call the academic social contract. Uh, together with my colleagues Mitchell Stevens and Carolyn Winterer, we now have a, a grant at um, internal grant at Stanford called "Recovering the University as a Public Good," and the sort of idea of this. Um, this project is that universities have always had reciprocal relationships with their host societies. And this is something that we forget, especially as we talk about the move to online, right? Uh, One uh. justification for university patronage and support has been that universities and societies serve each other's need in an implicit agreement. And that's what, what I call in this book an academic social contract. And we use this language also, Mitchell Stevens and I have written about this in the New York Times. And we talk about this in 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 our in our grant and our in our framing of this public conversation as well. And what we mean by this is that this contract reconciles academic ideals, like the ones we were talk, talking about, like the pursuit of, of of pure research or open scholarly discourse, for example, with the practical needs and particular ambitions of patrons, be they governments be they civil society organizations, be they cities or municipalities or private donors. Um, and I think this is a different framework from how scholars and typically write about the university. We hear a lot, I think, from the scholarly side of things about the university ideal abstracted from the world. But it's really important in my telling of the university that, that universities are, are nothing without hard compromises. And it's better to think about the history of the university, not as a history of an ideal, but as a history of compromises or contracts iterated by leaders over time. And there isn't one successful model for a contract or another. Gilman, he strikes a balance with a very successful one in Baltimore. Um, and by the way, if he had had his druthers, he would have done away with undergraduates altogether. He wanted nothing to do with them. This is very clear from the archival record. He wanted to create a pure research institution, but his contracting partners wouldn't go for it. He knew that the railroad magnates of being a railroad and the funders of the institution wanted some purpose, some place to, for their young boys to go to be minted before they went into the family business. That is, they, we, they needed an English college that would serve as a kind of finishing school. And so he creates that bundle I was talking about earlier of the undergraduate and the graduate institution as in some ways an answer to that compromise and an expression of an academic social contract. And what you see over time is that when contracts expire or they, they sort of run out, they lose their meaning, Mm -hmm. um, leaders have to make new contracts and find new partners and form new institutions. And arguably, we're going through one such period right now. In, uh, in the chat, about half an hour ago, the excellent Lisa Durf asked, are we at a crossroads uh, right now? And uh, I, I, I love that the answer that you just gave is yes. Yeah, I mean, I think that historians are, you know, historians are typically not good at predicting the future um, or having, you know, we don't have crystal balls. But but I do think that 2020 has a lot of the features of, are you going to show me a crystal ball, Brian Alexander? <laughs> yes, <laughs> you do. You are a self-proclaimed uh, futurist. Right. Um, oh, I'm getting a little feedback. Sorry, I think I laughed too hard. Um, and so... Yeah, I mean, I think 2020 has a lot of the features of one such crossroads. So, you know, a historically way rooted way to think about that is that the 30 year period, you know, that's really volatile that I write about from 1875 to 1905 has sort of the three has three aspects, I would say, of the that maybe it's the trinity of the conditions of possibility for change. It has external conditions. Right. That is things we can't control that sometimes come in the form of war, industrial revolution, um, heightened international competition. It has the forces of internal change. Right. It has the the, the desire for um, new spaces, new ideas, um, new ideals to talk about the ideal part of the story. And then it has the leaders. Right. It has the visionaries. 
without whom none of this, in my opinion, would happen because institutions don't have a life of their own. Rather, individuals like Gilman, like Humboldt, like Du Bois and Martha Carey Thomas are required who have the vision, who have the capability to, um, to sort of navigate the complex terrain required to strike successful um, deals and negotiate uh, winning academic social contracts. And I think, you know, as we as we survey the scene today, I think we, we clearly have the external shock to the system in the pandemic and in the racial pan crisis uh -huh. or endemic in our country. Um, uh -huh. But the question is, do we have the right ideas and do we have the right leaders? And are we training the right leaders to be able to be in a position maybe to take advantage of that external condition and, and create new academic social contracts? That's, I think, what we personally, what we, I think we might be focusing on. You say that, and, and I can't now not hear the University of Berlin trying to recover Prussia <laughs> after its defeat by Napoleon. Um, exactly. This is the place for uh, for everybody else's questions. And here's one from uh, Leslie Harris at uh, Bucknell University, uh, who, whoop, hang on, I'll press the right button, uh, who asks, if you could talk about the history of tenure in your country, <laughs> is this something you discuss in your research? And yes, the answer is World War One, as it is for almost everything. But please, Emily, please go ahead. Yes, it does. World War One ends up being, you're right, it, it's um, a catalyst for so many things which is great for a European historian like myself. I think it's part of why I became a European historian. But in the book and in um, also, I had a short um, article in the Washington Post over the summer about the origins of academic freedom, which kind of presents a bit of a capsule history of what is chapter seven in the book. I tell the story of what I call the invention of academic freedom. And indeed it's, it's a story about how the, the the war which begins to contract the space of, of, of the exchange of ideas and put limits on what scholars can write about and what they can say precipitates the founding of the AAUP in 1915 and its declaration on academic freedom and tenure. Um, and, and in fact, the story that I tell is also a story about how the mistranslation of the idea of academic freedom and um, and Lernfreiheit and Lehrfreiheit, which you know uh -huh. we could at that time we could do a whole other genealogy of the way that academic freedom in the German encompassed both the freedom to teach as well as the freedom to research. In America, becomes first of all it drops the it, it, um, I'm sorry it, it, the freedom to teach and the freedom to learn. In America, it drops the freedom to learn, right? That is, we're not really in 1915 con concerned about students and their ability to travel from university to university and sample the wares of professors and take the courses they want. Rather, we're really concerned about protecting the right of professors to be able to say what they want and to not be um, fired, for example, for expressing pro-German sentiments in 19. 15, 16, 19, 17. And so we, we sort of enshrine in the code of ethics of our, of our professional, our professional code of ethics, a different version of academic freedom than had existed in Germany. And the one that we enshrine is one that focuses on the right of professors to, um, to pursue the research that they want and teach what they want. But we do it in this way that I would call um, negative freedom um, following uh -huh. Isaiah Berlin. It's not uh -huh. a positive uh -huh. freedom to a particular uh -huh. set of values, yeah, as I would argue it was in Germany, where the university was a more free place than the than the political culture outside of it. Rather, we sort of organize it in this American way that's kind of consistent with our notion of civil liberties um, as a freedom from rather than a freedom to. So it's a freedom from constraints rather than a freedom to a particular set of values. And this this creates a set of problems that, boy, are we seeing play out right now. Because first, we, we tie academic freedom to tenure um, in a sort of circular logic, not really addressing the population that will effectively today does the bulk of the teaching right at universities, that is non-tenured professors, but also because we never really agree on what those values are 
for which academic freedom is in place. Sure, we say things like the freedom to teach, the freedom to learn, but, but we don't identify what they are, um, what's in and what's out, you know? Um, and that's, I think, where we see a lot of polarization um, around the debates of academic freedom happening uh, today as a result of that muddled, you could say, genealogy. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to uh, share this in the in the chat, and uh, in fact, I'll I'll uh, um, uh, <coughs> sure everyone can see this. Uh, this is just uh, we did a terrific uh, discussion with uh, Hank Reichman um, about uh, academic freedom, and he's just for me for my money the the world's go to guru on this. He's just a fantastic guy. Um, thank you, thank you, Emily, for that terrific answer. Um, we have a couple more questions coming down the pike, uh, and I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to ask them. Uh, and there's one uh, that Greg Shuckman had, and I want to make sure I get the right one here. Uh, Greg asks, what about Germany's system of tracking for students to pursue universities and how that serves as an advantage or disadvantage for developing the scientific workforce that is needed to fuel an innovation-focused economy? Do you want me to read that again, or? Uh, I, yeah, maybe the middle part of it. I can't. I don't see it, so it would be. No, it, it, came, it, came in, it came in the chat, and. Uh, okay, and, uh, I can't find it. Okay, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll just about Germany's system of tracking uh, and how right. that impacts. Is that an advantage or disadvantage for developing a, um, a technology and science-based innovation-driven uh, economy? Yeah, so it's a great it's a great question, and. Um, Again, history offers some sort of peek into why this happens this way and and what the repercussions might have been. Um, as you say, in, in, in Germany, by, by tracking, let, let's just say, first of all, we mean we mean that um, Germany has a tiered educational system with um, a higher tier being the gymnasium that is the sort of college bound system and historically one needed an abitur to enter the university which means that if you didn't go to this higher education bound um, school you couldn't even do the university right um, and if you did the other sort of uh, realschule or grundschule track you would be tracked for a technical institution or a vocational institution um, rather than a uni university. And what this meant in principle, as the Americans were sort of importing the system was, or what this meant in practice was that the Americans didn't have a gymnasium that was sort of a feeder into the university. And it's meant, and some reformers said at the time, um, you know, how can we even begin to reform the university if we don't reform our secondary institutions first? Because in practice, the gymnasium operated almost like the English style college. It's sort of like a BA. And, and in America, we sort of, we, we forgot that part of the reform. It sort of just fell out, right? And, 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 and the reforms of higher education and K-12 education kind of went in different directions and on different and, in, and in, on a different tracks. And so the result, to get back to the question, I think, is that Germany has this track system. And in, in fact, today, we look to Germany sometimes as an example for, um, as a positive example of providing, say, other alternative paths, we might call them pathways to vocations that are alternatives to higher education, that, yes, feed a kind of high-tech economy, you know, jobs at BMW and, and you know, working in, um, um, in te as technicians in the, in, in the sort of high-end technology industry. Whereas in America, we say we have this democratic system as we talked about before, but in fact, we might argue that in, we have the tracking, it's just opaque, um, right, to to the observer. So if you take a kind of, high school like the one that my son will likely go to menlo atherton that combines menlo park and atherton um and different streams of affluent and lower income communities you know anecdotally people will tell you that that high school is in fact tracked um and that 
And then uh -huh. there's a track for students who are going on to Stanford and, and other colleges like yeah. it. And that there's right. a track for whom within Menlo Atherton for students for whom that, that, um, that high school degree is the terminal degree. But since we say we don't have a track system, you know, we don't have, we don't provide arguably um, good pathways for those students who aren't going to do that college, you know, college bound track. And I think that's, that's something that, again, we can, we might, our reform conversation might benefit from thinking about um, that problem in a transatlantic context. Yes, that context. I already this is just <coughs> all kinds of possibilities. Uh, friends, we have about nine minutes left, which is shocking because we have so so much to cover. Uh, I want to make sure that we get in a couple of these questions. So Emily, there's about four questions. Oh, so I, I hope you get get like a, a quick whack at each one. Um, the excellent Kiel Deutsch, Deutsch excuse me, uh, argues uh, or asks. Uh, what do you think about the threat of disaggregating um, assessment uh, from education, from teaching? And what do you think about that as a as a challenge to higher education? Yeah, I mean, I think this goes back to the story I was telling, right, about about bundling, right, which is that historic and unbundling, right, mm -hmm. which is uh -huh. that there has been you know, disruptors talk about unbundling the university and and in, in many ways, it's just a different word for those challenges I talked about that came earlier, creating institutions that deal exclusively with one function or another, teaching or research, to which you add um, cred credentialing. And you know, we've seen attempts to do that today, to remove teaching in particular to other fora, to deliver it online, to deliver it in boot camps, to deliver it through other modalities that are supposed to be more accessible and most uh -huh. cost efficient. Um, but as you say, I, I mean, I think as your question implies, credentials turned out to be, I think, as a no number of analysts have pointed out, the sort of missing piece. So Coursera, for example, um, you know, was sort of talking the language of disruption during the beginning of MOOC mania in 2012. Um, but now, arguably, they're partnering with universities, talking about giving credentials, you might even say that they're sort of rebundling uh, the university because they found that unbundling it completely doesn't work, you know. Um, and you can see a similar thing happening on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, there's a new movement among Max Planck Institutes, which yeah. I said in 1910 was the first institution uh -huh. to sort of unbundle the university, to remove research because it was outgrowing the university and give it more money, more labs and more space. But now Max Planck Institutes around Germany are sort of trying to create graduate student programs like CS at Max Planck, which takes a bunch of Max Planck Institutes and sort of says, well, we're going to have a graduate program. Of course, they still need the university to provide the credentials. So they're partnering with them. But they're, again, rebundling the university because they realize that research teaching and the credentials that come with it, in fact, had a logic and had an institutional force that is undeniable. Emily, that's a that's a, a mini seminar of an answer in just a couple of minutes. Thank you, uh, Keel. As always, thank you for your laser-like focus on the question of assessment. Um, we have a, a question coming in uh, as well from. Whoops, uh, this is from uh, David Hool uh, at National University. Mm -hmm. Uh, and David asks, with the rivalry between U.S. and German research institutions, where do you see the issues of social and racial justice? Sure. So I think this goes back, David, thanks for your question, to the discussion we were having earlier about the problems of squeezing a sort of meritocratic system into a democratic uh, political culture. And I think that at best, what we see is a cycle of innovation in which, um, in which visionary leaders see the ways in which they can strike academic social contracts by bringing together the self-interest of institutions and the innovation that comes from tapping undervalued talent. And you see this with opening of the institutions to Jews and then the opening of institutions to women and the opening of institutions to African-Americans. 
And I think you see it a little bit in the language of identifying talent in opening the institution to uh, students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. And so I think this is an important point, if both about competitive emulation, because I think when you start to see other institutions doing it, whether it's within your country or elsewhere, if they're now getting access to better students that you don't have access to, well, then you're motivated to make those changes as well. Hmm. And that's certainly what happened. Um, and Mitchell Stevens tells this story in his excellent book about uh, admissions uh -huh. uh, with the, called the Creating a Class, which is about how elite institutions began to open up their, um, their admissions pools to, um, to non-white students, to, um, to students from lower socioeconomic background, um, and that there was a sort of domino effect that happened among institutions where one institution begins to redefine talent and the creation of elite class in a particular way that's more inclusive, making the term diversity part of, you could say, a metric on which on which top universities are assessed. So now all universities have to do that. Um, and perhaps that's a more cynical way of looking at the ways that institutions diversify. Um, but I think that if you're looking at institutional change, that is historically a way that that, that, that happens. Uh, David, that's a great question. Thank you. And, and Emily, that's a, that's a very, very rich answer. Uh, Lisa has a suggestion for you. She wants you to tackle Chinese universities next. <laughs> not gonna, not gonna, but, but, but that actually brings it to the uh, question that I'd like to ask. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, very, we're at the very end of time here. Sure. We have so, many, so many observations about how American <laughs> universities changed and developed. Uh, I was really struck by how you found that both Germany in the 19th century and America in the 19th century had a kind of parallel federal structure um, as opposed to the very unitary centralized states of, say, Britain or France, and how that that led to a kind of uh, competitive spirit <coughs> that, um, that really flourished. Uh, I, I was struck as well by your, your emphasis on academic entrepreneurs, uh, people you call the in-betweeners, um, like, uh, like Clark Kerr, in a sense, uh, who were able to negotiate between these different contradictory forces and produce something new. And I, I love your idea of competitive emulation. Um, I, I'm looking at those, and I'm, I'm as a futurist, I'm looking ahead. Mm -hmm. I'm, do you do you see that kind of federal spirit or structure still at work in the U.S.? Where do you see the emulations headed? I mean, Lisa's point towards China, I think, is a very good one. Um, should we, for the next century, for example, be thinking about the U.S. and China in that kind of yeah. relationship? Um, yeah. But, Point us a little ahead towards uh, towards the future of academic innovation. Absolutely. Um, so I don't think that 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 there's a one to one relationship between the federated structure and innovation. But I think what's in, what the sort of perhaps unchanging principle is is that competitive emulation that that you that you name right. And what's important for that is the open exchange of ideas, even uh -huh. and especially with one's rivals. Right. So I think that's where China comes in here. Right. Because what Americans rarely acknowledge is that the Chinese are following a path like our own. Um, if in the 19th century, nearly 10,000 Americans traveled to study in Germany, exchanging advances and trying to emulate those at home. China, of course, regularly sends some 350,000 students to American universities today. And of course, um, for those of us who've had, I had the chance to visit China in 2017 and talk with my colleagues there in, in, in Beijing and in Beida about this. And never have I had an experience that was felt like it was a reenactment of a historical play because the Chinese there is talking about how is it, are we going to become not only receivers of knowledge, but also producers of knowledge, yes. echoed almost uncannily the language of the previous century. And, and if, if I had a, if I had a sort of <laughs> a, a, that crystal ball, I think that that would be a good indication that if not, that's necessarily going to happen, right, China is the new America, that that's certainly, we should, be, we should have our eye on that dynamic yeah. And we should be careful, I think, to be advocating for the open exchange of ideas rather than shutting down our borders, uh, because that is the only way that knowledge advances. Um, it's not through a tit for tat. 
Um, and it's not through sort of intellectual protectionism. Um, Emily, I didn't know you had a background in theater because you you <laughs> timed you timed that last word those last words perfectly to a <laughs> conclusion. I love that you ended on the theme of an open exchange of ideas, in part because that's what the forum here is based on. But it's a very very optimistic, forward looking way to conclude, and and we are out of time. Uh, Emily, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. What What's the best way for people to keep up with you uh, and what you're working on over the next couple of years? Um, oh, thank you. This is this has been wonderful. It's been a pleasure. I've loved the questions. And I would, um, if people want to keep up with me, they can look at my site, I suppose, emilyjlevine.com, mm -hmm. where I have um, links to some of the articles I mentioned that I've written recently, like the history of academic freedom in the Washington Post or a piece that I wrote for the LA Times a few weeks ago, precisely about the importance of universities invoking that, that global mandate and promoting the open exchange of ideas. Um, and hopefully I'll we'll put a link also to the recording of this event um, on your YouTube channel. And there I look forward to being staying part of this community. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I just put your, uh, your website in the chat. Uh, we'll have the recording up as soon as we can. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, thank you so much. Uh, please uh, continue the fantastic work. This has been a real delight. And, uh, and above all, take care of yourself and stay safe, okay? Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Okay, take care. And thank you so much for the wonderful questions, everyone. Well, these are wonderful questions, uh, everybody. And uh, I have to second our guest in that. But don't go away yet. Let me just point you to what's coming up over the next few weeks. Uh, first of all, uh, we have sessions coming up on disabilities, eco-media literacy, the climate crisis, student debt, libraries and careers, minority students on campus, a whole series of great topics. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us to learn more. Uh, if you want to keep talking about these issues, if you're really concerned about tracking or about assessment or about this open flow of ideas, Please hit us up on Twitter. There's me, Brian Alexander, and Shindig Events. Uh, FTTE is the hashtag. And of course, my blog would be glad to hear from you there, brianalexander.org. If you want to go back into our archive and take a look at our previous sessions on the free flow of ideas, on academic freedom, on tracking, just head to our archive at tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. And once again, Thank you for the great conversation. I'm really happy that we were able to join Emily uh, and to learn from her and to appreciate her book. Please grab a copy of Allies and Rivals. I can't recommend it highly enough. And for the rest of you, as we run out of 2021, please keep up the great work. Please take care of yourselves. Be safe. And until next time, I'll see you online. Bye-bye.